All right, you guys have been asking for it. I'm back. Maybe you can kind of judge where I am. Just by looking around me, I'm actually hiding underneath the set of stairs. That should be the giveaway. I'm back in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. I'm visiting my dear friend, Mr. Dana Allen, the incredible Corridors breeder. So we're going to take a peek and see what he's doing. Maybe Dana will give us a few tips today. Now, last time we were here, Dana, you showed us, you made some changes, but you've also bred a lot of fish since I was here last. Last video we did was what, about three years ago? Was it? Yeah. yeah. Pro maybe not that long, but yeah. close, yeah. yeah. And how many, how many Corys have you bred in that time period? I usually try and do 10 to 12 species a year. Okay. And uh, Fully on track? Uh, we're closing on 60 species now, so it's it's been fun. That's a nice. A lot of fun. Yeah. Now, all the species that you're working with today, maybe we're going to take a little peek at some of the individual species that we're going to talk about, because that was the biggest question that came up in the last video, was like, what's this one, what's that one, and once you go past those 15 or 20 well-known ones, yeah. I haven't a clue, so, you know, but uh, what else has changed in the fish room? What's changed for me, and, you know, this, I've been doing this for a while now, um, in the last, I'm going to say month, month and a half, I've done three different lineage eight species of Corys. Now we talked a lot about those lineage and lineage eight are like the almost never done one. They're, not, like they're unheard they're not, of. They're not done often like in this tank here, if you swivel over to these guys, that's Cordoris Delfax. They're a lineage eight. I managed to spawn them. In this tank here, this is Cordoris Incolicana. I hope okay. I pronounced that yeah, right. I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, um, lineage eight fish. And in here, um, CW 97s which look like uh, an atroperson person on us on steroids. They were, like, they were big, the, the adults are in there. I don't know if you can see them or not. But the really cool thing about these guys is they spawn like cichlids. I've never seen that before with curries. They'll clean off the bottom, the gravel off the bottom or a spot on a leaf and the male will run across and then the female. So they're spawning on the bottom of the tank? So not all on the bottom of the tank, like they'll pick a leaf surface as okay. well. But the CW97 spawn on the bottom of the tank. They clean the, the sand off and they spawn right on the bare bottom of the tank. So you gotta wonder Just how they like do that thicker. in the wild. I, they clean a spawn, I'm assuming, right? Yeah. Whether it be a leaf or some kind of surface. Okay, the, like a platform spawner. A platform spawner, yeah. exactly. The Incolicana and the uh, Delphax, same thing. Never seen that before with Corys. So it's like a, that's like it the new trick very, that you're figuring out for some of these lineage age and it might, well, and you've cracked three now. That, I think four, because I have the Inspector Cory in here as well. Um, CW-155s, I want to say. <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, so basically, this is like Pokemon, Pokemon for adults, right? You got to collect them all. You got to, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, for me, it's a pretty big deal because you know they're they're not spawned off and like Delphax are a common fish in the hobby. Yeah, you see them regular wild imports regular, all the time. Oh, yeah, but you don't see any spawning reports, and you know I set out and intentionally did three um, species, and you know, and they all spawn. Now, where I was over at a good friend uh, the other day, a dear friend of yours as well, Mr. Uh, Kevin Acton, and he showed me this little trick that you showed him about the yarn of putting the mops, not only the mops, like we could see all the mops in the tanks, but he actually attached mops to the back of the, like the matten filters. He'll, I talked about this way that the quarry spawn on this strand. You'll, if you, I don't have any, the fish that I usually you do that with is the lineage one fish, the, the saddle snow quarries. Okay. They'll spawn on those strings all the time. So if you, uh, so like, if you honestly have learned different techniques depending on the lineage yeah. of, the, of the fish. Yeah, I would take the outlet of the filter here. It's turned down now because there's a small fry in there. Normally this would be a torrent. Yep. Um, but I'll tie up uh, one or two pieces of yarn and it'll flow right in the current. Yep. You know, almost the length of the tank. And it'll, ju it'll just sit there and flow in the tank. And they will spawn in that strand. Okay. Lineage one fish, definitely. 
So we were talking about, like, we, you just showed us some different tricks for, you know, some of the things that you've kind of learned with working with the Lineage 8s, which are the real challenging species for even the worldwide experts are, you know, we view those Lineage 8s as the real challenge. And you've shared with us some different tips that you've tried with different different groupings, like the Lineage 1 using the yarn mops. Now, anybody that's ever kept Cory's knows all these things about uh, the, the different triggers. So if it's a species that lives closer to where the Andes are, and it's going to deal with uh, more of those triggers, because when the ice caps melt and all that stuff comes down, they're going to need more triggers. But if it's a species that lives farther to the east, away from the Andes, they probably don't need as much triggers. Correct? Yeah. Okay. I would say so. Now, what other what other tips and tricks can you share with us, Dana? Um, one thing for sure, stressing the fish, for lack of a better way of saying it. When the fish are in their dry season, they're in the main body of the river, typically. There's not a lot of food because they're hiding because there's big fish in that river that would definitely eat them. So they're hunkered down. They're not getting a lot of food. The water is typically fairly warm. Um, so what I'll do with a lot of these guys and these three lineage eights, I did exactly that. I put them in a tank for actually quite a while, over a year, with very poor conditions. That there was too many fish in the tank, the, the temperature wasn't right for them, and I just left them in there. They basically got fairly neglected. I mean, there was food in there, but there was a lot of other fish in the tank competing for it, and Corey's like the eat. For spawning breeding catfish, um, stressing them is a really, and they're tough fish, so you, you can yeah. do a lot, but it's a really good trigger. Yeah. And don't be scared to do it. Like these, the, these three guys were in that tank for a year and a half. Yeah. Like I just ignore them. Basically. But we're also talking healthy fish. Like don't 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 take that as going down no, to the pet store and picking up some newly no, no, acquired no, no, wild cocks. Not at all. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're still looking after the fish, but definitely stress them. And and the other thing I want to um, uh, allude to is uh, and Ian Fuller said this: relentless conditioning. Like everybody here gets fed twice a day. Nighttime, I try and do live food. And you do it for weeks and months. And on some of the fish, lower tenses for one, you know, they're not an easy fish, to, or not a relatively commonly spawned fish, relentless conditioning. Some of the lineage one fish, like the... Um, but you're keeping them together, males and females. You're keeping them as a group and still yes. conditioning it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. The, these are all set up species tank. Lineage one fish, the males are fairly rough, fairly territorial, so you have to um, give them some hiding spots and places, you know, watch them because you'll end up with dead males otherwise. They're 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 pretty relentless. Okay. Best tip you can give about spawning quarries is patience. Like it, it might take months. Yep. Or years. Or well, a year. I mean Aquaeus, I still have not cracked that code yet. These and that's, guys, that's I, a relatively common one too. I stress this one to the point this this tank that you're looking at right now didn't have a water change for over four months. And healthy fish can take that. But it's that stressor. They need to know that something's happening in their environment. Exactly. Like it would in the wild. Yeah. Something's changing the environment that's going to be that natural trigger to get them to breed. So, you know, a um, ton of leaves too, because wherever they're living, there's trees. And yep. they, they dump a ton of stuff into the water. Yep. So these three tanks were literally stuffed with oak leaves. Yep. I mean, it, it's it, the water was tea colored. Yeah, you don't need fancy leaves. You know, you're more no. than welcome to buy if you know if it's a nice display tank, buying a lot of those fancy botanicals. But honestly, any good hardwood leaf will work fine. Yeah. And uh, oak leaves near oak, us is yeah. prominent and it's easy to collect yeah. as long as you get it from a clean source. It, it's the one you typically hear about, and it, it works fine. And then once if if you're lucky enough they spawn, then you take some of those leaves, you put them in the fry container. Now you got food for the fry. Yeah. Talked about uh, live foods being really critical. For, for you know for part of your success uh, I see here you, you've brought out your buffet you've got uh, <laughs> three types of live foods these are your basic your, your three types of live foods that you use for doing quarries I did it is yeah okay what do we got here okay and here we got white worms just reset this basically whole wheat bread with a little bit of yogurt on it and I put some brewer's yeast on it as well and that's the one that the, this this is a substantial yeah the worm right one of them's right there you yeah this see. is something that you feed to the adults this is adults yeah, yeah they, but they they gorge in them and white worms need to be kept in the fridge they do right? yeah so they're a little bit more challenging for the average they person love, they like around 50 55 degrees and it okay. does and it does make a difference what else are we looking at um, next here is uh, um, grindle worms easiest worm live food to keep what do you call it? a piece of glass a little bit of uh, um, 
And that's just potting soil, right? It's just potting soil, yeah. Organic potting soil, and no chemical, no fertilizer. And all I use on the top is, uh, what do you call a little bit of cichlid pellets. Which you happen to have around the house I, as well. I might have a couple of those as well. And you can see, this is literally, this is a daily. Yeah, and day. you just take the little screen off the I bottom. Take the screen off the bottom. I'll take this in the tank and do this. And just dip them in. You fed the fish. <laughs> Very easy live food for the babies, um, microworms. Now, uh, anybody that's a fish keeper worth their salt knows about microworms. Yeah, you for Corys, it's a must. I mean, the, the babies need some kind of live food. They're not going to do well on trying to do them. And microworms powerful. sink right to the bottom. They do, yeah. yeah. And they'll live in the water for quite a while, like a few days if they before they get eaten. Now, you guys, you Saskatoon guys got a unique trick here. We're going to unveil it to the world here. I was, are, told, I was yeah. told it had to be secret, but I asked him what these rubber bands were for. Here's the way to feed microworms. Take your rubber band, which is sitting on top. All the schmoo is gone from it. The schmoo. <laughs> Dip it in the tank. And all the white worms come off with all nothing white, else. And you and you literally irrigate your your culture at the same time. And that I is such a slick idea. It's the easiest. I've always been the type that always just wiped my finger yeah, around the line. rim. And, <laughs> and I, I used to do that too, but you get way too much cult, like, yeah. of, uh, culture in the No, nope, that's an absolutely great idea. It, so. It, it, it. For the super small cory fry, I'll use this. It's liquefier number one. Okay. You can get some amazingly small lineage four corys are typically very tiny. Also, lineage one fish, the corys, surprisingly, their fry are really tiny. Yeah. For such, and they're a big cory. Yeah. So just liquid fry food. How about baby brine shrimp? Is that too big to start? Uh, within, uh, sir, depending on the egg size, I'll judge by that way. But depending on the size of the fry, yeah, I'll, I'll start them right off and newly hatch brine shrimp. Okay. Yeah. All right, Dana, so you've given us some more tips this time. I think everybody's now armored to tackle quarries in a different way. So basically for, for success in keeping quarries, what would you sum it up as? Um, I'll quote Ian Fuller and patience. Just lots of patience. Be patient. Yep. It, they, they, the fish know what to do, provide the right conditions, and they'll figure it out. Yep, and you're at 60 species now in just a couple of years, right? No, uh, five years. I five years. Five years of it. So this, yeah. that's an incredible achievement, my friend. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for having us, Dana. You're welcome.